Good morning and welcome again to Devotions with the Deacon. Um, today we are in the beautiful Peace Chapel here at St. Mark's and I'm so excited to be able to film in here because it reminds me to remind you that the Peace Chapel is open 24 seven. And while we can't have services in here and we can't bring great crowds in here, this is a place that we can come and experience being in a worship space and with the memories and, and come and pray and so forth. So I want you to remember that. And so when you're feeling particularly um, lonely for St. Mark's or for a worship space, come to the Peace Chapel. And the garden is just outside. And it's beautiful out there. Um, and that's open all the time too. So I hope that's helpful for you because it is lovely here. Today we're going to spend a little bit more time on the Psalms, uh, but we also are going to move on to another topic um, as well. It's a surprise, you'll see. Uh, but first I wanted to tell you that I heard from Betsy about her favorite Psalm. Um, actually, she said she had a hard time picking a favorite because as she says, and, and I quote, so many times I've opened the book of Psalms and landed on a particular verse that addresses perfectly whatever it is I'm thinking about. I've made notes of many individual verses. And I have to say, don't you just love it when God does that? I, I do. That happens to me sometimes too. But Betsy does have three Psalms that stand out for her. They are Psalms 16, 136, and 139. And she said they all share one thing in common, which is um, how the Lord's love is faithfully shown in so many ways. So I thought um, we would read Psalm 16, which is from the first book of Psalms. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to shale or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. That psalm, um, I'm taking count about the, the, the phrase that you hear in verse 5, which is, O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. Sort of my portion and my cup. The Lord upholds absolutely everything for me, all that I need and all the security that I crave. And another, another um, phrase that I like, my boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. What more could I want than God and a lovely place to dwell? Thank you, Betsy. And then Kat had an interesting question or two that I thought were worth, worth answering for the benefit of all. Uh, one of them was about the three types of verse I mentioned last week, uh, synonymous parallelism, sympathetic parallelism, and antithetic parallelism. Her question was whether each psalm had an element of each type of, ver of verse or whether each psalm is strictly one type or another separately. And here's the answer. Most psalms are one type um, all the way through. The psalmist 
sets the tone with a particular type of parallelism and intends to keep it that way throughout the song. However, there are some that start with one type for several verses and then will switch to another, either to change the subject or maybe to introduce more drama or fervor into the song. Um, I think it would be fun as we pray the Psalms to see if we can find those examples. It's a really good question, Kat, and as you see, I'm not gonna find them for you. I think I'm gonna let you find them for yourselves, but look for that. It's a good question, and you can see what they're trying to do with it. And Kat also asked about the Hebrew versus English of the Psalms and the difficulties of translation and things like that. Uh, and I wanna talk about that for a second. Of course, all of Jesus' Bible is what we call the Old Testament. And it was composed in Hebrew and only many years later translated into Greek and other languages. And this was really tough for a very long time because the Hebrew of the Old Testament used, now listen to this, no vowels, no punctuation, no spaces between the words or paragraphs or sentences or anything. Um, the best spelling of this, uh, of the spelling, is, is the uh, Hebrew word Yahweh, or we call it Yahweh, um, the name for God, which was just spelled Y-H-W-H, no, no vowels, Y-H-W-H, who knows how it really sounded. And of course, chapters and verses were not numbered or anything like that. So translation and even understanding of the written text was really difficult for a very long time. And it stayed that way until about 900 to 1,000 years AD after Christ. At that point, a group of biblical scholars got together and wrote what, what is known as the Masoretic Texts. And what they did, probably after lots and lots of arguments, I would say, was to add vowels into the words to add spaces between the words, add chapter and verse numbers, and add punctuation. First of all, that made it all easier to read, but it also um, organized everything so that scholars could look at a particular, at particular sections and verses and know that they were all talking about the same material. Uh, I mean, you can imagine, it is so important to biblical scholarship that everyone literally be in the same chapter and verse. Um, and there's so much more to say about all of that and about Psalms, but I wanna move on now to another form of poetry that can be very useful for devotions and can speak eloquently to life as we're experiencing it now. Um, there are modern poets that look deeply into the human heart. Uh, Mary Oliver, who died just recently, is one. Wendell Berry is another, who are known for their spirituality as well as their eloquence. Um, other poets uh, published in a magazine called The Christian Century are one reason I'm a subscriber to that magazine. And Father Richard Rohr, who's a well-known Franciscan who founded the Center for Action and Contemplation called CAC has a podcast and website and everything. Um, and he recently included a poem that's perfect for right now. So there are two poems I wanna share with you as prayers this morning. To me, they both speak beautifully to another, to another way for us to think about what we're going through right now. They make me ask this question, can we replace the fear and anxiety and tension around COVID-19 and all that we're experiencing right now with something else or something more. Um, so let's look at that. The first poem I wanna read for you was presented by Richard Rohr and he wrote this about it, or he wrote this, these words in introducing it. Quote, the word change normally refers to new beginnings but the mystery of transformation more often happens not when something new begins, but when something old falls apart. That really made me stop and think. I thought, yeah, that's kind of what's happening to us right now. I think we can say in our world right now, 
Something old is indeed falling apart. So here's the poem titled Pandemic. It's written by a woman named Lynn Unger, who is both a poet and a minister. As Laura writes about her and her poem, the wisdom of her poem might guide us after the pandemic. Uh, also, as we strive to eradicate all the ugly viruses of sickness and injustice in our world. So I wanna read this poem to you, Pandemic. And think of this as a prayer as well, because it kind of can be. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath, the most sacred of times? Cease from travel, cease from buying and selling. Give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, Touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know, know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has become clear. Do not reach out your hands. Reach out your heart, reach out your words, reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live. And then, as we wait for the pandemic to pass, let's reflect on this second very short poem from the Christian century. The poem is titled, A Process Not to Be Hurried. Hurried. And it's written by Bonnie Thurston. And this is gonna be important. <laughs> A Process Not to Be Hurried. Long solitude is a gradual, drawing inward, going deeper, like autumn bulbs snuggling into the soil, marinating in darkness. When the isolation ends, do not hurry the process. First the shy green shoot, then the tentative tip of a fragile stalk arises to carry a bud opening slowly in its own time. I don't know about you all, but in general, I found our collective situation to be fatiguing, irritating, frightening, and inconvenient all at once. Sometimes I'm even angry. But these poem prayers inspire me to focus on what really matters which are the opportunities that we now have. And I made a list. <laughs> Number one, it's an opportunity to stop the crazy busyness of hurry, 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 which is what we have all been doing for years. The opportunity to replace that life of doing with one of being by reflecting and resting, reading, talking with friends and family, and rearranging our closets and our attitudes. And the opportunity to pre appreciate all that we have been given and to stop feeling sorry for ourselves and instead to look outward for ways to give to people who truly are in need or pain. So I'm trying to remember those things and I hope you will as well feel fairly strongly about it. So, and I hope that these poems have been inspiring to you as well. I hope you'll have a lovely week filled with gratitude for what we do have. Be safe, come to the, uh, come to the Peace Chapel and pray or sit and meditate. Look for poetry, look for reading, look for ways to be happy and peaceful in this world that we have today. Be safe 
And remember to stay connected and I will see you next week. Uh-oh, you're evaluating my work. I am. Are you subscribed? I will with a red button. And give us a thumbs up. I'm a fan. Of course.